morning, church. Today I'll be reading from Isaiah 9, verses 1 to 7. Nevertheless, the gloom of the distressed land will not be like that of the former times when he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will bring honor to the way of the sea, to the land east of the Jordan, and to the Galilee of the nations. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness. You have enlarged the nation and increased its joy. The people have rejoiced before you, as they rejoice at harvest time, and as they rejoice when dividing spoils. For you have shattered the oppressive yoke and the rod on their shoulders, the staff of the oppressor, just as you did on the day of the Midian. For every trampling boot of the battle and the bloodied garments of war will be burdened as fuel for fire. Will be burned as fuel for fire, sorry. For a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. You will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. The dominion will be vast, and its prosperity will never end. You will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. This is the word of the Lord. My name is Reino. I have the privilege of leading this church as pastor and elder. I have the privilege of opening up the Word of God with you this morning. Today's theme is The Light Has Come. So kids, remember that. The light, it's right next to me, and it's on this side, has come. That's the theme for today's sermon. Let's think about light. Light is awesome because light causes an reaction or a reaction. Have you ever slept in your room, kids? And then one of your parents switch the light, uh, switches the light on and you go, I was sleeping, but now I'm awake, right? That's what light does. Like you can't deny light. The moment light hits you, it draws a reaction. Light also brings life. Really, really important. These plants next to me cannot grow without sunlight. Did you guys know that if the sun would disappear on earth, I think, I'm quoting it under correction, in seven days, the temperature would be minus 100 degrees on our planet. In only seven days. That's how much we need the sun. Light in the Bible also symbolizes something else. It symbolizes truth. It symbolizes purity. It symbolizes goodness. Whereas darkness in the Bible usually symbolizes falsehood and sin, corruption, evil, and distress. Light provides safety. Any kids in the house that likes a little light in their room? Do some of you sometimes say, Mom, Dad, or Oma, Opa, please switch on a little light for us? Yeah, because when we see light, we feel safe. That's what light does to us. Light also actually provides healing. I don't know if you guys know that. Do you guys remember the COVID-19 pandemic? And during COVID-19 in South Africa, as we exited the season of winter, the actual sunlight started healing people. Do you guys remember that? That in the Northern Hemisphere, as they were approaching winter, they had a global shortage of vitamin D. Like they had to take pills to get them better. Whereas in South Africa, in the hospitals, they just told the patients, go and sit outside. Sit in the sun. I remember I had the privilege of being at Life Groenkloof Hospital in COVID lockdown time. And I stood in the medical center on the fourth floor and I looked down at the so-called COVID ward where no one else could go except the hospital staff and the patients. And I literally saw patients in chairs sitting outside and soaking up the sun. Like they couldn't talk to one another. They couldn't talk to any of their family. But they just sat there. And like as the sun beamed down on them, they got healed. Huh? Crazy. I mean, that's the beauty of light. And light also brings joy. Who's with me on summer as the best season there is? Right? I love it. The moment spring hits and we are back in shorts and the sun rises earlier, there's something inside of me that changes. Light brings great joy. So yay for early sunrises and yay for late sunsets. Light is good news. Now, kids, I want you to remember this. 
Christmas is about the light of Jesus Christ breaking into the darkness. Can you say that with me? Christmas is about the light of Jesus Christ breaking into the darkness. Once more, Christmas is about the light of Jesus Christ breaking into the darkness. That's what it's all about. And then I'm going to do one add-on uh, for everyone teens and up. I want you to know today that all of our longings are met in this Messiah. The one that was born. Okay, so how do we know this? If you look at our text, verses 1 to 7, we see there's news of the Messiah. It talks about the nature of the Messiah. And it also speaks about our need for the Messiah. So how do we know that all of our longings are met in Jesus? How do we know that Christmas is about the light of Jesus Christ breaking into the darkness? There you go. We've got news about it. We read about His nature. And we realize our need. Let me pray for us. And then we'll get going. Lord Jesus, we are excited to open up the Word today. Because what has happened is awesome. We realize that it's about your light breaking into the darkness of the world, into the darkness of our lives, and bringing all of these beautiful things to the fore that light brings to us. Thank you that we could sing about your birth. Thank you that Gladys could pray about your birth. Thank you that we can read about the promise of your birth. And thank you today that we can see the great news that comes with your birth. I pray, Father God, as we are together today as families, that we will marvel at who you are and, at, uh, uh, and that we would marvel about what that means to us. I pray that you would enlighten our minds and that you would stir our hearts, Lord Jesus. I pray that in your name. Amen. Okay, are you guys with me? Kids, are you with me? Let's go. How do we know all of this? Well, firstly, we read about the news of the Messiah. Lots of highlights. I'm going to have them up here for you. Let's just work through the highlights quickly, and then we'll chat about them. So, nevertheless, which means something happened before Isaiah 9. Then you see it will not be like, but in the future it will. We see a place mentioned there, Galilee. And then we see darkness, light, light, and darkness. This is a poetic device called a chiasm, right? So, darkness, light, light, darkness. And then we see something was enlarged. Something was increased, and then we've got two metaphors or similes here of experiences that people can connect with. There's quite a lot in there, right, in the first four verses, so let's work through it. Isaiah starts this chapter by saying, nevertheless. That means that something was going on before this chapter, and that was a pronouncement of judgment on the northern part of Israel by the Assyrians. Isaiah 8.22 says, they will look to the earth and see only distress darkness and the gloom of affliction and they will be driven into thick darkness i don't know about you that's not great news that's really really bad news right that's news that would make me shudder and then the rest of chapter 8 gives the reasons why the people find themselves in this position okay now where will this light be found because it says that they've seen a great light this light will be found in the Galilee of the nations. Do you see that on the slide? Some other translation says the Gal Galilee of the Gentiles. Now this was a shocking statement. Why? Because you would think that if God was going to do something big, He would do it in like the divine headquarters, the capital, Jerusalem, where everything happens. But instead, God decides to start rural. It's weird now, isn't it? But that's what Isaiah says. Now why? Because Galilee is in the north of Israel, and usually when Israel was attacked, they were attacked from the north. Their enemies would march through what is called the Fertile Crescent. It looks like a half a moon. And then they would enter Israel on the northern part, which means that those people, people in Galilee, they had a history of slavery. They had a history of despair. And God comes to them first, where His people had suffered the most. It's beautiful, isn't it? That area will see the light of the Messiah first. Okay, then let's look at enlarged and increased and rejoiced. What it says here is that God is spreading out this light to more and more people. It says He enlarged the nation. 
Why is God spreading out the light to more and more people? Because the Bible teaches us in Revelation 7 that one day we will be made up of people from every tribe, from every language, from every people, and from every nation. Right? So God is doing what He said He would do. Do you guys see in verse 2, it says they have seen a great light. If you read that in Hebrew, Isaiah is writing in the perfect tense. Which means that he's predicting something, but he's writing it as if it has already happened. Hey, eh? Think about that. I mean, parents, if you tell your kids to go tidy up their rooms, you would never say they have tidied up their rooms, right? Because you want to see it happen first. Isaiah says they have seen a great light and even though they haven't seen it, he is so confident that they will see it. He talks as if they have already seen it. It's cool, huh? Right. So he says that it will definitely happen. And then when it happens, this light will spread. And when this light spreads, it will increase everyone's joy. What kind of joy? Like will we go, yay? Or is it something more than that? No, 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 no. Look at what the text says. He says, they have rejoiced before you as they rejoice at harvest time. Harvest time is a time of abundance. Harvest time is a time where you see God's providence and fruit. Harvest time is a time when you rest from all the work that you've put in because now the food is here. It is a joyous time. And especially in Israelite culture, it was a time where they would make sacrifices and offerings and they would have a festival praising God for everything that God has given them. Isaiah says, that is how you will rejoice. He also says you will rejoice like you rejoice when they are dividing spoils. When a foreign kingdom was conquered and they would bring back some of the stuff from the foreign kingdom. You didn't deserve it. You didn't fight for it. You didn't own it. But now you have it anyway. Right? It's an abundance. You didn't have this, but there you go. You didn't have this, but there you go. So not only harvest an abundance for everyone, but more abundance on the abundance. How glad will you be if that happened to you? That's what Isaiah says. When this happens and when this light spreads, joy and joy will increase. With, and he uses metaphors that they know, they can feel it, they can imagine it, they can relate to it like they've been there before. Let's look at verses 4 and 5. So it says, you have shattered, right? Not spanked, shattered their oppressive yoke. Just as you did. Okay, wait. Who's the you? The you is God. Okay, great. Has God done this before? Yes, He has. When did He do it before? On the day of Midian. Kids, can you guys remember what happened on the day of Midian? Can you remember who fought against the Midianites? It was a guy called G -G 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 Gideon. Did, some, did, did, did someone just shout that? Yes, there we go, we our top job. So on the day of Midian is when God delivered Israel from the Midianites. It was when God fought for His people. You can read about that in Judges 6 to 8. Can I think about this? Gideon was an unlikely hero, and he won in an unlikely way. Are you with me? Do you guys remember the story? With torches and trumpets, he threw the enemy into a panic, and that led to the enemy actually slaughtering themselves. Weird story. But this pattern set forth in the Old Testament comes to fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Jesus is an unlikely hero who would set the captives free, but in an unlikely way. And how's that? It's through his death. So God turns the wisdom of the world on its head. And then, look at verse 5. Boots, garments will be burned. That's weird. Do you guys know what that means? What that means is even boots and garments, not just weapons, but the actual clothes that people were wearing that were making war will burn. It means war will cease. War will be over. Everything that could possibly remind us of a war will be gone. Because once this Messiah comes, He brings peace and there's no more war. Do you guys see that? It's beautiful now, isn't it? 
this Messiah will burn the boots and the garments of our enemies as well, which is sin and Satan and death. Do you guys realize that? Like the war is won against sin, Satan and death. It's over. It is finished. It is completed. And it all started with this baby being born. God becoming flesh. Okay, now how will all of this come about? And who will this deliverer be? Isaiah tells us. So let's look at the nature of, of the Messiah. We're going to think about his birth, we're going to think about his names, and we're going to think about his kingdom. All right, so lots of highlights there. Just follow them with me as we work through them. So, firstly, a child. Jesus was a human, guys, just like us, fully human, and he was born like a baby, vulnerable, small. And fully human like everyone else. Do you guys realize that Jesus in his humanity did baby stuff? Let's listen to the room at the back. Jesus was that age, actually. right? We know him as the exalted Christ. But he was a baby. Not only was he a normal human baby, though, he was also God. right? So that's difficult to explain. But he was fully human and fully God. At the same time. It's difficult for us to understand because I can't be fully human and fully God. I can only be fully human. But Jesus could. And we see that. Why? Because this son is given to us. He comes from somewhere for a specific purpose. And in Galatians, the Apostle Paul tells us that he comes from somewhere for a specific purpose. And that specific purpose was to be the perfect son. And God's grace is amplified for us here in this portion by the words, for us. Do you guys see it? A child will be born for who? For us. Christmas is about grace. For Jesus Christ to change you, you must receive Him by grace through faith. That is the ultimate gift. Now, let's be honest. Some gifts make you swallow your pride because you have to be able to admit that you need the gift in order to be thankful for it. I'm going to venture out on this one. What if someone gave you a case of deodorant for Christmas this year? Thank you. I really appreciate that. Might I be a little bit smelly? Not sure. Might it be that you think that I'm a little bit smelly? Am I a little bit smelly? I need to swallow my pride, put my nose in my armpit, and go, my word, would you believe it? I actually need your gift. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Do you guys see that I had to humble myself? Why? Because it's not necessarily a gift that I wanted, but it is a gift that I desperately needed. God gave us the gift that we desperately needed. Think about that, fam. God didn't send a personal trainer to the earth to make us all feel better about ourselves. God didn't send a life coach to help us figure out all of our challenges. God didn't send us a politician that would sort out government and legislation. He sent a savior. Why? Because that is what we needed. And he graciously provided them provided him to us so for us to receive jesus we have to swallow our pride and we have to call out to him to save us we must admit or you must admit that you're a sinner and give up control of your life people sometimes say that sounds a bit harsh and i remind myself of some of the very first words that jesus spoke in his public ministry repent That's what Jesus said when he opened his mouth, starting his public ministry. Repent. Why? For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent means turn. Turn away from there in this direction. Leave behind and go forth to this. It's the same as the odorant. You need it. So receive the gift. I just want to say, if you did buy the odorant for anyone, 
And they would happen to listen to this sermon. Just say to them, dude, I bought this before I know preached about it. Okay? <laughs> just say, just putting that out there. Okay, now we see four names of God. And these four names show His unique identity. They are titles that only God can have. Do you see them? Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Now, throughout Isaiah, the prophet laughs at human counsel. Right? He often says that humans do not possess the wisdom that they need. Like in Isaiah 28, he says that the leaders of Israel are misguided because they bank on human wisdom. Not this counselor. This counselor, we can build our, well, on the words of this counselor, we can build our lives. Because this counselor is always with us. Do you guys realize that? That's who he is. He's described as that. Your spiritual leaders or your disciples can't be with you all the time to counsel you. They just can't. But Jesus can. Your friends, your parents, your family, whoever it is that you bank on for worldly wisdom and reflection, can't be with you all the time. But Jesus can. We should look in the right place for wisdom and not in the wrong place. A wonderful counselor. Kids, let me show you something. Did you know that you can make a W with your fingers? Looks like this. Sometimes people say that this is for west, right? The west side. But today this is for a wonderful counselor. Do you guys see it? Right? So the, four, the first four names that the Messiah has given, wonderful counselor. Here's what I want you to know. Whenever you see your parents or whoever is in your house as adults, whenever you see them talking, needing to make decisions, you can actually bless them by saying to them, have you asked God about this? Have you spoken to Jesus about this? Can I remind you that Jesus is always with you and that he is your wonderful counselor? Great name, isn't it? Let's look at the second one. Mighty God. No one else ever in history could have this name. It always refers to God himself. A baby. Mighty God. Think about that. <laughs> A baby lying in a feeding trough of animals is going to take care of all the problems of the world. A baby doing baby stuff, needing his mom and dad, that will defeat his enemies. Marvelous, isn't it? So, I mean, that's why we sung, Mary, did you know? Because Mary held him as a baby, but knowing full well that this baby will become something. Everlasting Father. So this says that the Messiah, the one that is to come, the one that we now know is Jesus, loves us like a father. Tender. Merciful. Do you guys remember in the Gospels at some places, Matthew 9, Mark 5, Jesus talks to individuals and he calls them son. And he calls them daughter. And when he calls them son and daughter, he does so with affection. And luckily he's not temporary, because it says eternal father there, or everlasting father. It's a different translation. He was, he is, and he will always be. Why? Because he's God. Okay, let's look at the fourth one. We're almost done. The prince of peace. This prince will bring total peace. The Hebrew word for peace is shalom. It means nothing is broken anymore. Everything is whole. Everything is one. No one and nothing needs anything. That's shalom. Oh, Fab, can you imagine that? Just imagine shalom. Do you know of someone that needs? Do you know of something that needs? We're not there yet. But the text says that this prince will bring about this peace. Now, okay, he has brought about peace already. And that peace was brought about by reconciling enemies, us, sinners, people separated from God, to the Father through his death on the cross. And now we can actually have this experience of peace as we trust him. So think about it. Jesus gives us peace with God. And then he allows us to experience the peace of God. And one day he will bring universal peace. 
fulfilling the promises of God. Do you know this peace? Because there's peace already that was given to us. There's also a peace that is not yet. But luckily we don't have to bring it and we don't have to work it. It will be done by the Messiah. Do you have peace? I mean, as I was prepping for the sermon, I thought to myself, I think the times we live in, I could have made a whole sermon just on that. Because I think that that is what we desperately need. Do you know God's peace? And are you at peace? With God and in God. Isaiah 9 says to us that this ultimate king will eventually have the ultimate kingdom. There will be no more injustice in the world. There will be an end to every kingdom in the world. There's always been, but not this one. Okay, so how do we know that all of this will happen? Who guarantees that this kingdom will come? It's a funny line down in verse 7. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. Man, I just turned around and saw all the other highlights. We actually don't have time, but let me just say this. Do you guys see that the portion of scripture that Marie read this morning was a recital of this portion of scripture about his kingdom, the throne of David, the fact that he'll reign, that he'll establish it and sustain it. Did you guys see it? Beautiful. Nice reading, love. Absolutely appreciated that. Let's get back to zeal. Do you guys know what zeal is? Alistair Begg, he's a well-known theologian, he says, this zeal is God's passionate commitment to bring about his redemptive purposes. God's plans are not last-minute responses to world events. Do you guys hear that? God's plans are not last minute responses to world events. No, 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 no. He's always been committed to this. So God isn't cold. He's not indifferent. He is zealous. It's a beautiful word, isn't it? And that's the only way that God knows how to love us. With zeal and with passion and with wholeheartedness. Now Isaiah says here in verse 7, that this light will come to people who are in desperate need of hope and in desperate need of salvation in the midst of a very, very dark world. And in today's dark world, the world we live in, we know that this light has come and we know that He will come again. Fam, my Christmas sermon is actually really simple. In one line, behold your Savior. Just look at Him. Because light has come. As our wonderful counselor, he has divine wisdom. Listen to him. As our mighty God, he defeats our enemies easily. Let's rejoice in him. As our eternal father or our everlasting father, he loves us with a tender and an eternal love. Enjoy him. I think that's a proper word for the holidays. Enjoy Him. Do you know how? Have you recently? Have you today? Because He's to be enjoyed. There's not a lot of things that brings me more joy than our kids enjoying me. And sometimes enjoying me literally means like we get our lion on, right? I'm on the ground and they are on me. And it's pinching and licking and tickling and fighting and wrestling. And I go, yes, my kids are actually enjoying me. They don't need anything else. Because I'm their dad. We should enjoy our eternal father. That's my mission for the holidays. Oh, I'm going to enjoy the beach. I'm going to enjoy the waves. I'm going to enjoy some ice cream. But I am also going to enjoy the Father. Just be with Him. Just be with Him and enjoy Him. As our Prince of Peace, I want to remind you guys that we've been reconciled to God. We've been reconciled to one another. And we look forward to the day in which we will enjoy total peace in a new heaven and a new earth. We should welcome this peace we should anticipate this peace. Merry Christmas. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, thank you for being our wonderful counselor, our mighty God, our eternal Father, and our Prince of Peace. Thank you for fulfilling your promises. 
And Father God, because of your zeal, thank you for staying faithfully committed to what it is that you said that you would one day do. And thank you that we can now celebrate the fact that the light has come into the darkness. We praise you, Lord Jesus, for becoming a baby, for becoming fully human and remaining fully God and still sorting out our fallen state and our brokenness. Thank you for the ultimate gift. We receive it and we praise you for it. In your name, amen.